Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak today at the Hot Topic session. Uh, we'll be talking about worship space acoustics based primarily on a recent book that came out published by ASA Press uh, with uh, Springer Publishing as well. Uh, my co-editors on that book were Erica Reihard and Lauren Ronsi. I'll talk a little bit more about the book in, in just a moment. Um, but I want to sort of stop and, and, and think about what some of the acoustical design goals might be in a worship space so we can set the scene uh, for some case studies that I'll show you a little bit later on. And then I'll also show you some of the, the data that we gathered as part of this book initiative. Um, the way I like to think about worship spaces is that anywhere from the clanging of bells all the way to the whisper of burning incense, acoustics is paramount in the worship space experience. Oftentimes, folks don't immediately think of sound as being part of worship, uh, but it certainly has a, a, a great influence. Um, so what, what do we tr try to achieve in these, in these spaces? I'll talk about a few of the, the, the higher uh, level goals that we look at as architectural acousticians. So the most important is to provide an optimum uh, reverberation time. Reverberation time is defined as the amount of time necessary for a sound to decay to one millionth of its initial intensity. City. Um, this is a really evident acoustical attribute when you walk into a room. You can kind of think about it as the time necessary for the sound to decay to inaudibility. So for example, in this room, if I were to clap, you hear the initial sound from my hand and then you hear some reverberance in the space and that sound energy dies away over time. And the time necessary for it to become inaudible is reverberation time. And each kind of space, whether it be a worship space, a concert hall, or even a classroom or a lecture room like this, has an optimum reverberation time. Worship spaces have a really broad range of optimum times. Uh, they, it could be anywhere from less than a second, like 0.6 seconds, all the way up to cathedrals with really long reverberation times on the order of 10 seconds at 1,000 hertz. The way that we control reverberation time is primarily through the size of the space, the volume of the space, and the total amount of absorption in the space. And absorption is anything that's fuzzy. So uh, this is actually one of my favorite kinds of absorbing materials. It's by a company called Loop. It's basically just felt, but I, I'm kind of a, a, a design nerd, so I, I like some of the things that they do. Uh, we are all fuzzy materials. We actually absorb a lot of sound. Uh, and then in worship spaces, you have to get a little bit creative because a lot of those spaces are made primarily out of wood or concrete. And so where you get that absorption is one of the design challenges. Another design goal is to eliminate acoustic defects. Uh, acoustic defects are anything that essentially takes away from the acoustic goals in the space. Um, one of the primary ways that we can get defects is through the process of focusing, just like a curved mirror would focus light, curved surfaces focus sound. Um, so on the left-hand side, I have a plan view of a uh, space where the back wall is curved, and any energy that's incident on that back wall will then be reflected into a focused pattern. And that's un undesirable because you want a uniform acoustic experience throughout the space. You don't want one person to receive a lot of acoustic energy and another person to not receive any. So one of the ways that we can alleviate that is through uh, diffusion or changes in the geometry uh, to move away from planar surfaces or flat uh, surfaces. Uh, this is actually my primary area of research, studying diffusion and diffusing surfaces. But there are a few different techniques that we can uh, use to avoid acoustic defects like this focusing or echoes or other kinds. The third uh, primary acoustic goal is to minimize ambient noise. Um, and so the ambient noise can come from a lot of different places. It can come from external sources. If you build a worship space right next to a train station, you're going to get noise and vibration there. Um, oftentimes, they'll have the baby cry room in the back, and that's definitely uh, a noise that you want to mitigate. Uh, and so they'll have those glass partitions where they, they have uh, the parents stand with their children. Um, the people inside the space themselves make noise. We can't do much about them because we kind of want them there, but uh, we, we, we try to think about that as well. Uh, essentially trying to mitigate any uh, noise or acoustic signal that's not part of the desired acoustics. This last uh, acoustic design goal is a little bit related to minimization of ambient noise, but this is talking about maximizing the dynamic range. So this is more about the relationship between the background noise level and the signal level. So in this plot, I'm showing uh, something called an impulse response, which is a tool that architectural acousticians use to characterize uh, the acoustic behavior of different spaces. It's essentially a sound pressure versus time graph for an impulsive source or a short 
uh, loud source. Um, the blue dot is indicating the signal, the, the thing that's reaching the listener from the source. So that would be like my hand clap. And then the orange dot is indicating the location in the impulse response where you come to the ambient noise. And the dynamic range is essentially the difference between those two, and you want to maximize that. So you can maximize that dynamic range by decreasing the ambient noise, and you can uh, maximize that range by increasing the signal. In a lot of worship spaces, that entails the use of electroacoustics, so loudspeakers, microphones, even um, personalized hearing listening devices. Uh, and so electroacoustics is a rich part of uh, the acoustical design and worship spaces. So these are five of the, of the key design goals that we think about when we go into these types of spaces. And I want to um, show you how these design goals play out in some of the spaces that appear in uh, the book that I mentioned. Um, so this is the book that, that was published by Springer. Uh, it's a part of an initiative by the Technical Committee on Architectural Acoustics. Uh, I'm not trying to sell the book. Uh, the editors and I, we make about six cents for every copy, I think, and so we don't really care if you buy it, but uh, I think it's a cool book, so I want people to know about it. Um, it, it, it features uh, uh, 67 different spaces from 12 different major religions, five countries, 22 states. Uh, it has an acoustic uh, primer and a glossary, and then several perspective essays from different members of the design teams that are involved in these uh, worship spaces. So I want to actually read you a very short excerpt from one of those essays. Uh, this is by Gary Sebine, uh, who is a prominent architectural acoustician. Uh, he says, the soundscape of worship is based on the presence of the cosmos, God, or higher power worthy of worship, with whom people feel a need to communicate in a variety of ways. Sometimes this is manifest in isolation as one confronts his or her God alone in silence, in the dark of a small niche apart from the main space, or in the light of a solitary candle. Sometimes it is manifest in the joyous singing and praying or sad wailing of the entire community, joined in corporate celebration or solemnity of momentous events in life. So first of all, Gary's an amazing writer, so I would get the book just to read his essay. Um, but two, I like that, that little excerpt because it really does demonstrate how important acoustics is as part of the worship experience. And, and that's one of the things that this book uh, explores. So I want to go through uh, just a few case studies with you to, to point out how these acoustic design goals uh, have played with the worship goals uh, or worship design goals uh, in these spaces. So I'll start off with this space, which is called Young Israel in uh, Brookline, Massachusetts. Uh, it was built in 1996 and seats 550 people. Uh, it's actually a Jewish Orthodox space, and that means that there are some um, particularly challenging acoustic uh, uh, goals that we're, we're trying to satisfy here. Uh, in an Orthodox space, you actually can't use electroacoustics, so maximizing that dynamic range is difficult. Um, so you have to do it through passive or natural acoustics. So for example, this space is a fan-shaped space. Uh, when you look at it in plan view, it, it resembles a fan. That allows us to bring the parishioner, uh, the, the audience essentially, um, closer to the sound source, the person speaking at the altar. Um, another issue uh, that uh, the acousticians ran into in this space is that uh, um, in an orthodox space, you have to have the women and the men separate from one another, divided by uh, a partition. And you can see that glass partition in the back, uh, and the acousticians and the architects worked really closely together to uh, use that partition in a way that was in line with the religious requirements, but that allowed for the acoustic requirements to be met as well. So uh, there's some transparency through that partition, and it's at a particular height where you get some diffraction, which we learned about in the last talk, uh, so that the members uh, you know, behind that partition can still hear what's going on in the front. I'll give you uh, a few pieces of data as we go along. This space has a reverberation time of one second at 1,000 hertz and a background noise level of 15 decibels at 1,000 hertz, which is really low and, and good for this kind of space, essentially, because uh, there is no uh, electroacoustics, so you want to get that increased dynamic range. I want to go to a totally different space now. This is the Star Performing Arts Center in um, Singapore. It was built in 2012, and it seats 5,000 people. This was part of a $375 million project. It also happens to include a shopping center and a few other um, 
uh, pieces in the in the project. Uh, but you can see how massive it is. Um, this space is a Christian non-denominational space, non -denominational space uh, and it's used for a variety of other purposes as well. Concerts, uh, musical theater, corporate and national events, and they actually do televised events in this space too. Um, therefore, it requires a really low reverberation time, particularly for the televised and highly uh, electroacoustic events. Um, so believe it or not, the reverberation time in this space, even though it sits, seats 5,000 compared to 500 in the last space, is only 1.5 seconds at 1,000 hertz. And they were able to do that through uh, innovative use of acoustic absorbing uh, materials. So basically everything that you see in this picture except for the piano and the stage is absorbing. Even those side wood walls are perforated and there's absorptive material hidden behind those. Um, there's also uh, an underseat plenum to allow the the uh, air conditioning and heating uh, air to seep into the space slowly so you create a minimum background noise level uh, to again uh, obtain that high uh, dynamic range. Uh, obviously electroacoustics is used heavily in this space so there are a lot of loudspeakers and microphones that you can't quite see in this picture. The background noise level is 15 decibels in here as well uh, which is pretty impressive considering you're having to um, ventilate this entire space, a really big space. Okay, so I, I'm trying to give you very divergent examples from the book. So this one is actually uh, a mosque in Atlanta. It's called El Farouk Majid. Uh, it's actually the largest mosque in uh, the south, uh, and it's modeled off of mosques, uh, more traditional mosques. Um, so this is built in 2007. Uh, it's a $10 million project, seats 1,500 uh, people. One of the things that I think is the most interesting about this space is how they treated those domes. So you saw the domes in the exterior picture, and now I'm showing you the dome from the interior. And domes are anathema to architectural acquisitions. We hate domes, right, because they focus sound energy like that picture I showed you earlier. So they, they were really creative in this solution here. The acquisitions and the architects worked together to um, work with a material that has uh, these micro beads embedded in uh, a, a plaster uh, liquid that then becomes solid. So uh, they were able to trowel that uh, material on the interior of the dome and then it hardens and behaves and looks a lot like plaster except for the fact that it has these micro beads in it and so it becomes porous and is able to absorb the sound. And they're also able to paint it so you can still have the beauty of the interior while still mitigating some of those acoustic defects and so um, they were able to eliminate the focusing effects of that dome. This space also has a reverberation time of 1.5 seconds at 1000 Hertz and a, a background noise level of 20 decibels. This is the sacred space. It's in Boston, Massachusetts, built in 1998, a $400,000 project. It's interesting because it actually used to be a chapel that burned down, and then they uh, renovated it and rebuilt it, and now it's used as a multi-faith space, so a lot of different <coughs> kinds of worship um, uh, activities take place in here. Um, one of the things I think is interesting about this space is their innovative hiding of that absorption. I think that's probably a thing I'm into because I'm now realizing that's in a lot of my examples. Um, but these rose-shaped ceiling panels are actually, half of them are perforated and they have absorptive material behind it. The actually more interesting part of this space is that it's used um, for worship services that, uh, in this condition where the uh, folks are not allowed to wear shoes, so there's a separate room right off of this where um, people take off their shoes and leave them there. And so they have this big exhaust fan to remove the fumes from the, from the shoes, and it was really, really loud, and so the acquisitions had to work carefully uh, with the uh, HVAC engineers in order to minimize that, that noise, because uh, you don't want a loud fan when you're, when you're meditating or praying in this space. So uh, this has a reverberation time of 0.5 uh, seconds at 1,000 hertz and a background noise level of 20 decibels. Okay, so this is the last uh, space that I'll show you. It's the Congregation of Temple Israel. This is a non-Orthodox space, so uh, it doesn't have some of those challenges uh, that I talked about in the first uh, synagogue, but it does have a challenge. Now, I actually love this space. It's the cover of the book. I think it's absolutely gorgeous. But unlike a lot of spaces, worship spaces, um, they've used glass for almost three quarters of the entire room. And glass is another thing that architectural acquisitions hate, because you can't hide absorption very well behind glass, right? 
Um, so they did a lot of treatment on that in um, inset circular portion of the ce uh, ceiling. There's a lot of absorption up there in order to minimize the reverberation time and other echoes that might want to be avoided. Uh, they do use electroacoustics in this space. This is a computer model of the room uh, where they did a heat map to show the distribution of the sound pressure level throughout the space to ensure adequate coverage for uh, the members. Not only do I think this space, uh, it, not only do I think this space is beautiful, but I also am intrigued by it because it's part of something called the Tri Faith Initiative. The Tri Faith Initiative is um, a 14-acre area in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, and it's made up of three Abrahamic faith groups. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit from their website. Uh, the Tri Faith Initiative is made up of these three groups who have chosen to be in relationship together as neighbors on one campus committed to practicing respect, acceptance, and trust. The three members are Temple Israel Countryside Community Church, UCC, and the American Muslim Institute. And the reason that I think this is interesting is one of the things that we learned in working in the book is that lots of different kinds of worship uh, groups, different kinds of religions, actually have similar acoustic goals. They're essentially trying to create uh, a space where you can worship in congregation in some way, or worship as an individual. Um, and so this really brings that home by putting those three different groups in one place. So this is the, the synagogue I showed you before. They actually have a, a building where all three faith groups can come together. Uh, and, and then there's uh, uh, the mosque uh, and then uh, the, the UCC church hasn't been built yet. So there are no pictures of that. Um, but I really liked that idea of talking about interfaith dialogue and, and different kinds of worship groups working together when you're dealing with something like acoustics, something that's basically physics. You don't often get into these conversations uh, in our field. And so uh, we were really inspired by, by that, and, and it was one of the reasons we chose it as the, as the cover for our book. So uh, our goal is to get really deep into the data that was collected as part of this book. The book is right now meant to be a compendium of case studies to be used primarily by consultants so they can see the kind of work that has been done in the last 30 years. But ultimately, we're interested in data trends and analysis. So for this talk, we put a little bit of data together just to kind of give you a sneak peek of what we hope will become maybe a JAZA article or something like that. Um, so here are the background noise levels from all the different venues, the 67 venues that were in the book. Um, and essentially, you can see their background noise is high at low frequencies and low at high frequencies. That's not earth-shattering news. What I think is interesting, though, is the, the, the range. You have a, a really broad range in background noise levels. Uh, and certainly, some of these we would consider to be unacceptable. And so we want to delve into the kinds of spaces these are. Maybe certain uh, worship space types uh, are more forgiving of background noise level than others. And, and we're going to do this analysis uh, in, the, in the future. By the way, this is sound pressure level as a function of uh, octave band center frequency. Um, Again, uh, octave band center frequency on the horizontal, uh, but now reverberation time on the vertical in seconds. And this is the data from all uh, 67 spaces. Again, a really broad range. Uh, and I had mentioned that at the top, that worship spaces allow for a really large range in reverberation times. Uh, and so we'll delve into this as well to look at how that might compare to the size of the venues, the types of religion that are practiced in each of the venues, and things like that. Um, one thing that we're starting to look at is relationship between seating capacity and some of these acoustic data. So at the top there is a graph of seating capacity versus space volume. And essentially what we see is the space gets bigger, you can seat more people. That's not that exciting either, but it, it allows us to study seat capacity as an indicator of size of the space, which we do in the second graph. And so on the second graph, the vertical is showing seating capacity for certain ranges. This is actually how the book is divided up. Um, and then on the uh, horizontal, we have mean reverberation time at 5,000 hertz. And in general, for the first three seating capacity categories, you can see the reverberation time increases as seating capacity increases. But then when you get into the very large halls between 2,000 seats and greater, the reverberation time actually drops back down, which was unexpected, I think, at least on, on my part. You would think bigger spaces, bigger reverberation time. Um, but remember the Star Performing Arts Center, that had a really low reverberation time at only 1.5. 
25 seconds. And it's because these big spaces tend to rely on electroacoustics, so they need that low reverberation time in order for those electroacoustics to work properly. Um, and so I think that's probably where this data trend is coming from. But again, we'll analyze that in uh, more detail as we move forward. Uh, our, our goal is to uh, look at venue uh, typology, the type of programming that happens in the spaces, and, and key design features that show up as well. And then we'll use statistical analysis. And we'll also start to look at the text that was provided by the acoustical consultants and see if we can find some match uh, between uh, the data that we're seeing in the hard numbers and the more qualitative descriptions of the space. So, I don't know, hopefully that will become a Jazz article and you'll get to read about that then. So that's all I have for you. Thank you very much for listening.